It's been quite a while since I published anything from my window seat interview series. It was an interview series that I started up you know, back in 2020, I think, or 2021. And has always been a great excuse for me to speak to photographers that I really admire and kind of pick their brains about what they do, their journey to get to where they got to, and kind of learn from other people's experiences. In today's episode, I got to speak to a photographer who is not only brilliant at capturing the moments, the people, and, you know, the places around him, but is also great at documenting that process. Behind the scenes of being a photographer, the things that it's taken for him to get to where he is. I'm sure you'll probably already know of him and his amazing work, but if you don't, I will let him introduce himself. And I hope that you enjoy this episode of Window Seat. My name is Wesley Verhoeven. I'm a photographer and curator based in uh, Amsterdam. I was gonna say New York City, but I live in Amsterdam now. <laughs> but I lived in New York City before this. Um, and uh, I do mostly portraiture uh, work. So it could either be in uh, photojournalism for magazines or papers or uh, for uh, in a commercial setting for companies like marketing campaigns that feature people. And uh, I published my first photo book last year, which was exciting. And in a, in a few weeks, the second print of that book comes out. The book's called Notice. And I created that during the pandemic uh, when I was stranded in Vancouver, British Columbia. Amazing. Um, I, I do want to talk to you about the process, actually, um, but we'll we'll get onto that towards the end. Uh, what I, I'm really interested in knowing what brought you what brought you, what's brought you to Amsterdam. Let's say that again. Um, well, my uh, my parents live not so far away from here, and uh, I was I was born uh, in the Netherlands and uh, mm -hmm. lived lived here as a child and uh, teenager, and then lived in the United States for most of my life, like the biggest chunk of my life, and. Uh, during the pandemic, um, a couple of things happened. Number one, the world changed, right? And, mm -hmm. and people's priorities changed as well. Uh, and number two, I was in the middle of a um, nomadic period where I was living all over the world, like three months at a time. It would be like Tokyo and then Buenos Aires and then uh, Mexico City. And um, obviously when the pandemic started, that, that had to stop. So I had to figure out where I wanted to be at the time I was in Vancouver, which is why this book was uh, created in Vancouver. But um, I didn't, I couldn't, I, well, I could have, but I didn't really want to go back to New York city because it was very bad there during COVID, especially the first period. And uh, that's what we're talking about now. And so my parents live here and I want to be a little bit closer to them as they get older as well. And so I was like, well, I'll just go to Amsterdam for let's say six months, and uh, and now uh, then I really liked it, and so now I live here. Now it's like two years later. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, yeah, like I actually want to go back a little bit into childhood talking. There's um there's an interviewer in the UK who I don't know if you're aware of. He's called Stephen Bartlett, um, and he starts off all of his interviews talking about people's childhood. And I think for me, it's always interesting to know if people, photographers who, who end up photographing as adults were also interested in photography as a child. So for you, was, was taking photos as a kid a thing? Well, not only was it a thing, it's my father's profession. So, so well, actually at the time when I was a child, it was not his profession, it was his uh, passion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's a teacher and now he's retired, but um, yeah, so photography was always in the house. Cameras were pointed at me at all times. <laughs> And um, and part of, you know, our weekends would either be going to go for a hike in the forest or we're going to go to an art gallery uh, and so, uh, usually photography, but also painting and things like that, because his father was a painter. So there's a lot of um, visual arts in my family. Absolutely. Do you feel as though having your dad have that interest in photography has shaped the sort of photographer that you are today then? Um, I, th I mean must have right i think I, I mean i grew up playing with my legos in the red light of the dark room in our <laughs> attic like on the floor you know so i mean i'm sure it had a massive impact on me and 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 in terms of stylistically our my dad's photography and my photography is quite different stylistically but we are both uh fascinated by people and and just very curious about what people are thinking and what they're up to and so while while, while it might not look similar aesthetically we do 
are, we are both drawn to just like people and their stories a lot. Amazing. So what was your kind of journey into photography then? Uh, as a child, I, I would go along with my father on photo mm -hmm. walks uh, with, uh, you know, I would, might have been, I don't know, six or seven. And I would I would get his second, you know, his second body. It would be like a Canon AE-1 or a Canon A-1 because this was still in the film era, like at the very end of the film era. And um, I would just go with him. And I think I don't remember having these thoughts, but I imagine that you know, I also associated photography with like spending time with my father, which is of course what most children would love to do. So I would go with him. And then at some point in my teenage years, I wasn't that much of a rebel, but the one thing that, that I did do was like step away from photography and like find another creative passion, which was music. Uh, and so I ended up uh, making music into my first career. Uh, I got back to photography after maybe 10 years in, in the music business where, where I got a little bit burned out on uh, just kind of the general culture in, in the music business, which can be uh, very intense and uh, kind of uh, political. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to, um, I, I just wanted to do something where I was relying only on my creativity uh, again, rather than where, you know, when you're working in music, you're relying on a lot of different people's creativity and professional levels and all that kind of stuff. So I kind of found my way back to photography, maybe like um, about 10 years ago. Right. And was that in the sphere of music that you that you were photographing or was it completely separate? <laughs> no, sadly, it wasn't. If I would have if I would have been into photography already when I was working in music, I could I have I would have a portfolio of a lot of famous people right now, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> because I would meet a lot of famous musicians, but that just wasn't on my mind at all. I was making music, um, so uh, it had nothing to do with that. I, what, what happened was when I got a little bit burned out on music, I took a break, and in that break, I traveled around the United States. Uh, to all these cities that I never really got a chance to go to because I was so locked down in New York City for my work. Um, and while I traveled, I would meet interesting people and take their portrait just just for fun, just as creative expression. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of got out of hand. I ended up making a, a photo project out of that called One of Many. And for that photo project, I traveled to 12 different smaller cities in the United States. And with smaller, I just mean not New York and L.A. and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, so places like Nashville or Charleston or New Orleans. Amazing, amazing cities with amazing creative communities. And I, I documented the creative community in each of those cities, about 50 different people per city. So that was a project of about 600 uh, creatives and portraits of them and little interviews with them. And I was just doing it to feed my own curiosity, but that, that which sort of went viral and it got sponsored. And then it just kind of like slowly like led me into a career as a photographer. Amazing. I, I'm always really interested at how people's personal projects or their self-initiated projects kind of lead into maybe bigger opportunities or, or opportunities in their career. And um, one of the amazing clients that you work for is uh, National Geographic, right? You've done a lot for, for them. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in knowing of all the kind of projects that you've shot, whether it's self-initiated or client projects, what would be your favorite? What would be the most, most interesting to you maybe? Ooh. That's a tough question. Um, I mean, I think, I, and I, I bet that the, the answer is the same for you. I think that most of us are most satisfied by our self-initiated self projects, not necessarily client work, even though we both, we love it too. But when you have full control, <laughs> it is even better, right? So for me, I think that project, one of many, uh, changed my life. Uh, and and also some other people's lives, which is even cooler. And uh, I'm currently doing kind of like a spiritual uh, a sequel to that project by doing a similar thing uh, in Amsterdam, where I'm also photographing the creative community, except this time it's more, it's not just like one portrait per person, but it's like a whole chapter per person with details about their space and their tools and all that kind of stuff. And so that to me is the most fun, but I get, because I get to meet interesting kind creative people i get to spend time with them learn about what moves them what makes them tick uh and and document that whole thing and usually uh if things go well which they tend to do 
they have a really great experience and they feel seen in their in the photos and the my favorite thing is always if someone almost everyone always says like oh by the way i'm very awkward and i'm not good in on photo in photos and then i'm like don't worry about it that's what that's my job and then afterwards if they say like oh wow this is like my favorite photo of myself ever or oh that's really like this is really what it looks like you know that is very satisfying for me um to to hear and that kind of like just keeps you going so for let, let's take this this project that you're working on at the moment in terms of equipment do you is it analog is it digital is it a mixture how how do you go about it's a that? mixture i i do each of those it depends a little bit on the space because i always take pictures of the people while they're doing their creative work in the space that they do it in so sometimes it's a a, a gallery if it's a painter for example or sometimes it might be uh, a, a wood shop or a sh kitchen if it's a chef that kind of thing uh, and so it depends a little bit on the available light um, mm -hmm. but in Amsterdam there's a lot of creative spaces that are f in buildings that are historic because the city has all these historic buildings that aren't being used anymore for whatever they were built for for example there's like the former French embassy is now being used as artist studios temporarily but temporarily means like for the past five years okay. uh, and so there's not necessarily like some of those buildings don't necessarily have a lot of light and so I ended up I end up shooting a lot of stuff with with flash both on digital as well as um, analog so my setup for this project is basically Canon uh, Mark IV 5D with a flash mm -hmm. uh, Contax G2 with the flash and a Hasselblad when I when I have uh, like available light and I can take portraits with them. So that's usually kind of like the setup. And in terms of creating kind of consistency between using, you know, different cameras, different mediums, how do you try to do that? How do you try and keep, is, is it in the narrative? Is it in the style? Or is this something you do in post-production that tries to kind of tie everything together? Well, I mean, I always, for this particular project, I always shoot the same film stock uh, and sometimes I also mix color and black and white for this project, which is something I enjoy doing, which I also did for my book, um, because I like being able to give a different perspective on kind of like the same space or the same person because color, I mean, even right now, like I'm in black and white and you're in color, right? And it's like a different vibe. Both are cool. It's just a different look. Um, and so, um, and I don't overdo it on trying to get a certain consistency but the fact that i shoot flash for both analog and digital does create at least a uh, compatible visual language it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same because the film is going to look you know grainier than the i'm not going to add fake grain to my digital photo but uh it still will take this kind of like a similar color palette and it's it will still take like harder shadows which is what i usually do for this project so um for me it doesn't have to look exactly the same it just has to feel like it belongs to the same story mm -hmm. have you ever That's seen cool. um um natural born killers which is a, a movie from like the i don't know 90s or something it's like an amazing movie that was written but not directed by quentin tarantino before okay. he ha did most of his films and uh it's it's a really creative film because they mix different media so like some of it is in is in like a very different color palette than other things some of it looks like it's shot on analog some of it is like crispy it's very cool i would highly recommend checking that out just as a visual inspiration amazing no i'll definitely give that a look and then i guess let's let's go back to your book um notice and you said that you released that in what was it was it 2021 that you released that i I spoke to you earlier about, you know, my, my own ambitions in kind of creating a photo book. So I'm very interested in understanding that process and how that was for you, how you went down kind of narrowing the, down the theme, what was going to be be in, in that book. Well, it didn't start out uh, with the thought, I will be making a book. It started out mm -hmm. with me being like, OK, I'm stuck in Vancouver. I can't work here legally or I okay. mean, there's just no jobs also because it was the pandemic. And I'm a person that is very um, routine based. I need to have certain things because I, especially when I travel, my life is quite hectic. But if I, as long as I have a few routines that I can keep like going with, 
whether it's like, oh, in the morning, I always do this, or I go to a coffee shop, wherever I might be, it's the same coffee shop I go to in that place the whole week, for example. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't really sure what I was going to do or how long I was going to be in Vancouver, because at the time, they still thought that the pandemic would last eight to 10 weeks. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I just kind of <laughs> added time to the trip. And I was like, well, I guess I'm here. Uh, let's do a let's do like a long photo walk every day in this one little suburban neighborhood that I was stuck in. You know, my typical pre pandemic, my typical move would be I go to a big city somewhere in the world and I go to the busiest part and I take pictures of people. I, I stop people. I have a conversation with them. I take pictures of them. And that's where my creativity would flow. And in this case, I was stuck in a, in a suburb, which is the quietest part of the city. And I couldn't talk to people because no one was on the street because we all had to stay inside. And so I had to really change around the way that I took photos and even just the way that I was seeing. And so instead of running around uh, fast in a busy part, I was in a quiet part and I was walking very slowly, very intentionally. And I was, the book is called Notice because what happened was that I started noticing much more beauty, much more wonder, much more surprise, things that I would just run right by uh, previously, whether it's the, the, the shadow of a basketball ring on a garage door or the way like a flower is coming out of the ground because it was springtime at the time. And, and so the more, every day I would do this walk in this one little area and I just kept going because I kept being there and I did it for 123 days in a row. And as I was doing it, all I was really trying to achieve was not go crazy, like have some mm -hmm. sort of stable mm -hmm. thing in my day as a meditative practice. And um, what ended up happening was like a few weeks in, I was like, well, I think I'm taking pretty good pictures. They're very different from what I usually do, but you know, maybe I can get like a couple of prints out of it that I could sell because also all my income had also gone away, of course, like most freelance yeah. people at the time. And then a couple of weeks later, um, I, I was like, well, maybe I have enough for uh, a zine. Like, you know, it could be, could be cool. Make it a little scene. And then a couple months later, I was like, I wonder if I have enough for a book. And, and I was talking to my friend, Dan, throughout this procedure, uh, Dan Rubin, who is, who's the designer of the book and also a great photographer. And, um, we started kind of like batting ideas back and forth and decided to make a book and, um, like, which he designed, which, I which I was so pleased with, cause he's such a good designer in addition to being a great photographer. And so that's kind of just how that happened. That's amazing. And how was that kind of received, I guess, you know, when you put out a photo book was, was the reception what you kind of anticipated? It was better than I anticipated because the first print almost sold out completely in the, in the pre-order, which I, I hadn't really anticipated at all, but it was super cool. And uh, I'm really excited for there to be a second print now. I didn't think there was, you know, most photo books don't have a second print. So it's pretty cool that this one does get to have one. Um, and what I learned as, as well is that I learned so much from, I've worked on many other books in the past as a curator. So that's mm -hmm. different, but like doing the whole process from, from cradle to grave, it was so interesting to see how interested other people were in the process. Cause it's quite fun, you know, not only to do, but it's also fun to follow along. I'm like, Oh, here's some test prints. This is how this works. Oh, you know, this is how we chose uh, the particular kind of linen. It took me like seven weeks to find the right linen for this book because I was very particular about stuff. And like we color matched the, we color matched the cover of the book. The linen is a particular kind of yellow and we color match it with specifically the flowers that I photographed in Vancouver that were yellow. Uh, wow. And so there was all this like detail and I, love nerding out on craft and detail. And so for me, the process was super fun. And I was, I guess, surprised a little bit that it was also really fun for other people. I thought people would find this much too inside baseball. <laughs> no, that's, it's, I think, you know, anyone that has that kind of like level of attention to detail that and, and carries that craft throughout what they do. I think, you know, things like that, they're always going to be a success, aren't they? So I'm glad, I'm glad that the reception has been good for it. Um, and, and you've spoken a lot about process generally as, as we've gone through these, these, um, this conversation. 
And so I actually want to talk about process as in your online newsletter, um, where you talk about all things photography, all things process. Um, what started that off for you? What, what have you found um, documenting your process has, has changed or has it impacted it? And, and how, how do you find that that is embedding in your, your process now? Yeah, I, um, it started out with my disillusionment with social media, basically. <laughs> and uh, there's so many limitations on, on what we can do as photographers on social media, as simple as, oh, a horizontal photo doesn't really work on Instagram, right? Yeah. That's like, and I found myself only shooting vertical photos suddenly, like not because I was thinking about it, but because I, somewhere in my mind, you know, and that's not okay. Like, <laughs> I don't, I didn't want to be like that. Uh, plus, you know, like you're, be you're beholden to the people who control the algorithm, the people who choose, like, even though you might follow me, you might never see the photos that I post, even though you said you wanted to, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to have a more direct relationship uh, with the people who appreciate my work. And so that's why I started the newsletter. And yeah. it's been amazing. It's been one of my best choices that I've made because it is a much more intimate relationship and it's so fulfilling to get messages from people saying like that because I explained a certain thing that I felt that they could do it too, or in some sort of way they've decided, like what we talked about earlier with like a self-assigned project, like that's a drum that I beat all the time, like work on self-assigned projects. It's so important. And there's, I've in my, on my bookshelf, I have probably 15 or so little zines or books that, that people tell me like they made because they felt like they got the permission and the courage to do it from reading about how I made mine. And so mm -hmm. that's super fulfilling for me. It's really special feeling. Um, and it's also impacted how I work because now I document the way I work. And that's also led to me being more intentional and more conscious of what I'm doing when I work because I'm thinking about the process rather than just like shooting, you know, which is um, been helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, the interesting thing about me obviously reading a reading process is it kind of feels like you're privy to something that's a secret, something that, you know, is away from social media, but um, getting to understand your process and hearing your thought process feels like something secret that I shouldn't be reading almost but but in a good way in a good way um but at the end of your process newsletter you do these takeaways where which basically sums up like the key the key things that you've that you've written about in that newsletter and I guess what my question is now is have you got a takeaway over time that has really stuck with you that's been more prominent than than others and then I just mentioned the fact that <clears throat> people should not wait uh, but do like do what they want to do. So the example I always use for this is um, if if you live wherever you live and, and you're like, oh, man, it would be really cool if one day the New York Times would uh, email me and say like, hey, could you please make a story about this interesting person in your city or in your town or whatever it is? And and then you go back to your regular life thinking like, oh, it would be very cool if that happened. But you don't have to wait for the New York Times to call you, you could literally just go to a person that you find interesting if if that's your style of photography, people, and and reach out to them and be like, hey, I, I really like what you do or I find, I, however you live your life is so interesting to me. Would it be okay if I come take photos of you? I'm, I'm just doing it because I'm an artist and I would love to show it to other people, blah, 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 blah. And most of the time people say yes. And then once you do it, you could actually send it to a local newspaper or the New York Times, if it's the kind of story that the New York Times would be interested in, and things might happen. And so my main thing is self-assigning, just like what am I interested in? What makes me feel alive? What makes me uh, feel like on fire creatively as, as a human? Go do it. Just don't wait for permission from some sort of imaginary like leader in the sky uh, or some big assignment from a big publication, you could literally do the exact same thing. And if it's a self-assignment, you can do it exactly like you want to do it. It doesn't have to be like, you don't have to worry about like how, how it needs to fit into a certain box. Like it could literally be just the way you want to shoot it, mm -hmm. which is the best. No, absolutely. 
have you have you got anything else that you want to kind of add because that that is my questions coming to a complete now um no i'm just just that i really enjoyed talking to you and i really like what you do and uh, your work is really lovely and it's nice to watch you on youtube so i'm i'm pleased that we got the chat ch oh thank you very much no it's been a pleasure speaking to you you know you, your work is amazing and you're a massive inspiration to me and you know i think I'm going to definitely, you know, plug process so much because it's been so insightful for me to read and, and I hope that a lot of other people find the same insight in it. But yeah, thank you so much for, for chatting to me. Of course. Thank you. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day. A massive thank you to Wesley for speaking with me in today's episode. One of my favourite things about running this series, like I said earlier on, is being able to listen to the stories of photographers that I really do admire. And I hope that this conversation has inspired you in the same way that it inspired me. I will link Wesley in the description of today's video, but please do head over and check out his work if you haven't already. I'll also link his newsletter process in the description of the video. You know, it's free, so there's really no excuse as to why not to sign up. And another reminder that you can deep dive into the whole of the window seat series if you are interested in catching up on the conversations I've had with some other photographers and creatives on the channel. But also, you know, let me know if there's anyone that you would like me to speak to on this channel. It's something that I really enjoy doing. So if there's someone that you think would be an interesting conversation to, to be had, if there's an interesting conversation to be had, then let me know who you want to see featured and I will try my best. But thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.